Thank you, David. It's nice to be here and uh, my first time here at the Great Debates. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to debate myself, uh, my wife said, because I've never won a debate at home. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I was going to, in the next uh, 25 minutes, uh, try to review some of the new therapeutic approaches for the treatment of our patients uh, with ALL. Uh, these are my disclosure slides. I'm a consultant uh, for a variety of these uh, pharmaceutical companies, but don't own any uh, relevant stock or interest. And the first thing is that we have a lot of data to go over in a very short amount of time. And so I just remind you that uh, I'm going to do the best I can, uh, uh, but I think we're only going to have to, a uh, very short amount of time, just maybe even swish and uh, spit here. Uh, but this is a real patient. I, I thought I was going to be the only one doing patients, but uh, my three prior colleagues uh, beat me to the punch. Uh, this is one of the lovely patients, a 21-year-old who was a senior at Georgetown University, uh, was home for April vacation. Uh, visiting her uh, parents uh, a few years ago uh, uh, during Easter, uh, who had had multiple dental procedures and kept bleeding one after the other after the other, uh, finally got a CBC, which uh, probably should have been prompted earlier, but anyway, uh, had a CBC, uh, showed a white count of 85,000 with blasts, hemoglobin 10, platelets are 17,000. She came into the Brigham. Uh, a bone marrow examination confirmed uh, that she had lymphoblast in her marrow. The flow cytometric analysis is listed there, so this would be a precursor B cell ALL. Uh, she did have a translocation involving chromosome 1 and 19 and was BCR able negative by PCR. Uh, and so there are a variety of options that are available to us or were available to us back uh, eight or nine years ago. And one of the things that we've been doing at our own institution for the last 15 years is having a uh, pediatric approach for patients under the age of 50. And so this patient was enrolled in one of our pediatric inspired trials. It is now about eight and a half years out, uh, graduate still working in DC, doing remarkably well. And so that prompts me to one of the presentations from Wendy Stock. Uh, Wendy uh, was one of the founders of this idea that a retrospective analyses have shown that younger adult patients have fared much, much better if treated on pediatric trials as compared to adult uh, regimens. And she took a large cooperative group trial uh, and reported on this at ASH. Uh, based on her uh, data, which is uh, presented on the right hand or the left hand part of the slide, this is the long term up, uh, outcome for patients, young patients treated either prospectively on on uh, adult regimens or pediatric regimens, and you see here that the disease-free survival that she reported uh, a few years ago in blood was markedly improved on the pediatric trials, and this has been uh, uh, corroborated for a variety of uh, large cooperative group trials on the other side of the pond, so to speak, in French, UK, the Netherlands, Italy, the Dutch series, a few of which are shown here. And so what uh, Wendy did was she took the current children's cancer group trial, CCOG trial, and adapted it to uh, adult patients under the age of 40. Uh, details are listed here. And what she was able to report at ASH uh, was that the event-free survival uh, was markedly improved as compared to historical controls. Uh, we're not able to do randomized trials in this disease given the rarity, uh, but she reported a median event-free survival of 59 months and a two-year EFS of 66%, which was the best ever done in either the uh, CLGB, now Alliance, uh, ECOG, or, uh, or SWOG database. And this is the overall survival with the median not reached and a two-year OS of about 79%. There were two issues uh, that will come uh, to fruition in the next few years. One is the bcr able like signature. There was a beautiful uh, paper from uh, St. Jude's showing that there are patients who are BCR able negative but have a gene uh, signature very similar. And, and uh, this has been associated with a poorer prognosis and uh, Wendy re recapitulated this uh, in her pediatric uh, uh, study. Uh, and really where, we're, where the field is moving is measurement of minimal residual disease. For those of you who are not doing this routinely, for your patients with ALL, I encourage it because MRD is the great predictor of how patients are going to do uh, long term. Uh, and this is present uh, in Wendy's uh, study as well. Uh, from the uh, Farber side, we took our 15-year experience uh, using these pediatric trials, not only at our own institution, but also with our colleagues in Canada, and compared it to the CIBMTR database. Uh, for those of you who get your blood online, uh, the GRAL, the French group, just reported their analysis with a very similar uh, result. 
And what we were able to show was that the cumulative incidence of relapse for these younger patients was really no uh, statistically different between the transplant and the chemo, which is a little bit surprising for many. Uh, but what was different was the, uh, not, this is not surprising, was the treatment-related mortality. And when you look at the overall survival comparing transplant, this young group of patients, Philadelphia negative now, uh, pediatric regimen compared to transplantation, uh, in the confines of a retrospective cohort analysis, the chemotherapy arm seemed to benefit. So we don't transplant our patients, uh, our young patients at least, with uh, ALL unless they have high-risk cytogenetics, Philadelphia, MLL, hypodiploid, or if they're MRD positive at the end of induction. And this was the disease-free survival. So moving on to what uh, David had suggested is there's a lot of business in ALL finally for the first time looking at relapse and refractory disease. Uh, and this is a case that I uh, got called up while I was at ASH this year, actually. A 22-year-old from Burlington, Vermont, uh, graduated from St. Mike's up there uh, in December, uh, who had been diagnosed with ALL in 2012, late 2012, uh, was about two years onto this uh, pediatric trial that I just presented to you, uh, presented with a really non-plus uh, type of ALL, low white count, less than 50,000, normal cytogenetics, uh, and uh, was really uh, doing remarkably well until a routine marrow uh, right after Thanksgiving showed that he had uh, recurrent disease. Uh, so I saw him when I got back. Uh, we initiated blinitumumab right around the holidays. He went into complete remission, was MRD negative after a cycle of remission, and then uh, just was discharged, actually, uh, for his 10 out of 10 uh, unrelated donor transplant. And so uh, this is a data from the ECOG study showing the dismal results of a large group of patients uh, with relapsed ALL, uh, regardless of whether they were uh, consolidated with an allogeneic transplant, although the allogeneic transplant out beat the chemotherapy by 9 to 7%, so there was a little bit of a win there. But you can see here that we need better strategies for our relapsed ALL patients. Uh, one of the approaches is to try and strike while the iron's hot and, and not to allow patients to relapse. So if we know that a patient is a high risk of relapse, maybe we can start uh, before. And I just remind you of some of this historical data, mostly from the German group, that the measurement of MRD after induction is the highest predictor of who's going to do well and who's not going to do well. And this is a slide here. Uh, this is molecular. It's very hard to pay for that. It's very expensive. We, we don't do it outside of a clinical trial in our own institution. What we've done is uh, MRD by flow. In order to do this, you need to have a multicolor machine. You need to have pathologists who are very comfortable separating out hematogones from non-hematogones. And just some ex uh, examples, this is a representative case of a T myeloid ALL with a very small persistent uh, population uh, that's easily identifiable. And here's a patient with, with no aberrancy in a, pre, in a, a pre B cell ALL. And you can see again that the blast population can be identified and distinguished by a good pathologist from hematogones here. And so these are cases that we would send, these are patients that we would recommend stem cell transplantation and first remission. And based on our data at the Farber, uh, looking at those that are MRD positive versus negative, uh, it meets the two finger rule, so to speak, as to uh, outcome. The patients who are MRD positive really have a very poor uh, long term outcome. So, moving on to novel therapeutics, uh, there's a lot of data using monoclonal antibodies. Uh, given the limited time, I'm not going to have time to review all of these. Uh, rituximab is obviously uh, uh, FDA approved for patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's been used in CD20 positive ALL uh, and, uh, and with some success, and I'll, I'll leave that to you to look. Uh, alemtuzumab has been uh, added to B and T cell ALL in a uh, consolidation platform by Wendy and the CLGB, and we won't have time to review that either. So I'm going to focus my attention on some of the novel therapeutic strategies for CD22 and CD19 uh, monoclonal antibodies. So CD22 seems to be an attractive target. It's present on the vast majority of B-cell ALL, over 90%. It is internalized upon antibody binding, which is important. And CD22 does not seem to be shed into the uh, serum, which could be used as a sink and decrease the effectiveness of your monoclonal antibody. Iprituzumab is an unconjugated anti-CD22 antibody. It's been tested in a wide variety of uh, uh, 
uh, treatment strategies. This is one example, and one I'm going to show, uh, where it was added to a COG uh, relapsed uh, regimen. This is uh, the so one of the so-called TACLs, T-A-C-L, pediatric groups, where they add these phase one drugs to a backbone. Uh, and unfortunately, there was no improvement in the remission rate, but there was a significant improvement in the rate of MRD. Uh, Ipratuzumab is being tested in Europe in a randomized fashion in consolidation, very similar to what MD Anderson did with uh, rituximab in the CD20 positive ALL. Uh, to something that uh, maybe have a little bit more teeth, uh, inotuzumab, ozogamycin. Uh, as the name implies, this was a holdover from the Wyeth days using gemtuzumab, uh, calichomycin conjugated anti-CD22 antibody, with the whole idea of these mechanism of action that the uh, monoclonal antibody and drug conjugate is going to attack CD22. As I mentioned before, it gets internalized. The uh, molecule gets uh, uh, acid uh, destroyed in the endosome. Calichomycin gets released and hopefully causes a double-strand break leading to apoptosis in obviously those patients who are drug sensitive. There's been a lot of studies using uh, inotuzumab uh, ozogamycin uh, for patients with relapsed refractory ALL. Uh, there's been some single institution trials from MD Anderson, and then the Pfizer-led trials in uh, phase one and phase uh, uh, two setting. Uh, using a weekly strategy. And as you can see here, the overall response rate is in the high 50%. I remind you, this is single agent activity. And for those of you who cut your teeth in ALL, you know that the approach to ALL is not single agent, it's multi-agent therapy because no single agent has a significant activity more than 10 to 20%. Here we're seeing single agent activity and outpatient for the vast majority of these patients uh, in the 50 to 60% range. Uh, one of the important aspects of these monoclonal antibodies is not only the high response rate, but the fact that most patients who go into remission are able to achieve a minimal residual disease negative state. And at least based on the uh, studies that we've shown here, uh, over 80% of our patients treated on the inotuzumab trials were able to achieve an MRD negative status. One of the uh, Achilles heel of this drug, and as I'll come back in a second when I talk about blinatumab, because it recapitulates in that setting as well, is the fact that patients with a high blast count, a high circulating blast count, now, circulating blast count tend to have a poorer response, likely due to a, a sort of sink, if you will, and absorption of the monoclonal antibody drug conjugate. And so the patients who seemed to fare better were those patients who initiated the uh, monoclonal antibody at the time of a low blast count, uh, which may be argued to maybe a pretreatment of steroids or other agents to get patients into a better setting. Uh, and this is the obligate Kaplan-Meier complete re remission duration and uh, progression-free survival. And I borrowed this slide from uh, Susan O'Brien at the MD Anderson, now at UC Irvine. So there are some medically important safety events, just like Mylotarg, as you all remember, uh, hepatotoxicity was uh, one of the banes of that uh, antibody, and it is the same with inotuzumab, with elevations of the liver function test and ascites, specifically in patients after transplants. So you've got to be careful in what type of regimen that one goes to in transplant. You want to avoid high-dose alkylating agents as a conditioning cytopenias, uh, particularly thrombocytopenia, uh, and as I've already alluded to, elevation of liver function abnormalities. Uh, there was a phase three trial comparing inotuzumab to standard of care. It was a take your pick, uh, high dose ARC regimens. Uh, and this trial met accrual in December. We're waiting the uh, analysis, and hopefully, this will be approved uh, soon if it's a positive study. Uh, once you have a drug that is active, it's nice to take it out of the relapse refractory setting up front. Uh, uh, congratulations to Dr. Jabor and his group at the MD Anderson. What they took is the hyper-CVAD, which, as we all know, is not the most trivial uh, regimen to give specifically to older patients, and they watered it down. So the mini hyper-CVAD, if you will, no anthracycline, reductions in cyclophosphamide, and then added inotuzumab, uh, arguably limited follow-up, small number of patients, but the progression-free and overall survival seems uh, rather remarkable. Moving on to CD19. So the 
First uh, CD19 molecule I'm going to address is the uh, antibody from Seattle Genetics. Uh, this is a monomethyl aristotin drug conjugate against CD19 with a very similar mechanism of action to other drug conjugates. Uh, there's parallel studies in ALL and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and both adults and pediatric children uh, and pediatric patients, so applauding the idea of trying to move these agents into younger patients uh, with relapse refractory disease. And both weekly as well as every 21-day regimens are being explored. Uh, so far, this is a phase one, and we're not even close to the MTD, but about 20% of patients have achieved a CR or a CR without full recovery of platelets. Uh, and, uh, but most of the patients have had at least biologic activity. As I mentioned, the MTD is not established. The biggest issue with this particular agent is ocular toxicity. There seems to be some deposition of the Aristotin compound with the antibody in, on the conjunctiva, conjunctiva, uh, conjunctiva, and causing conjunctivitis very similar to the cytarabine-induced conjunctivitis that we see. And so steroid eye drops uh, uh, for prophylaxis and treatment uh, have really abated some of these complications. And then blinitumumab. Uh, one of the first real advances, I would say, uh, in our armamentarium with ALL. Uh, this is a novel uh, approach where you're taking uh, the business end of a CD19 monoclonal antibody and mixing it with the business end of an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody. And what this does is it brings the T cell, the immune system, uh, to the lymphoblast, causing upregulation of the T cells, activation of the T cells, and hopefully attack against the tumor. Uh, I just remind you, with this type of approach, you don't need uh, specific T cell receptors, right, because you're bypassing the T cell receptor. You're not requiring MHC1 peptide antigen recognition by the T cell. And you're able to then make any of the T cells, all of the T cells active against the lymphoblast. Uh, this was first tested in the setting of minimal residual disease by our German colleagues. They took patients who are MRD positive by molecular testing, the slide I showed you uh, uh, from earlier, and then asked the question, can blinitumumab place these patients into remission? And in fact, the answer was yes, 80% of them did, including patients who were Philadelphia positive. So some of these patients were pH positive and still went into molecular remission and with a, with a really high degree of durability. So the drug can be used in MRD positive, given the fact that in the United States, very few centers use MRD, specifically through molecular basis, this was not going to be an FDA approvable strategy on this side of the uh, Atlantic. And so what ended up happening is a confirmatory phase two trial now in patients with active disease was uh, brought on. Uh, this was presented at ASCO last year and published just a few months ago. These are fixed doses. Uh, nine micrograms per day for a week, followed by a step up to 28. Uh, and this was treating 189 patients with uh, relapsed or refractory ALL. And uh, just some, uh, so hopefully you can read this, about 43% of patients achieved a complete remission or a complete remission without hemologic activity. And in the box here, of those patients who went into complete remission, 82% of them achieved a uh, minimal residual disease negative status. Again, very high single agent activity, very high ability to achieve an MRD negative state. So these antibodies, I think, are revolutionizing our approach or will revolutionize our approach to therapy. Uh, all patients seem to benefit. And I, I bring the highlight to this last, hopefully you can see it right here. The patients who fared the worst are the patients with the high blast count or reciprocal, the patients who fared the best are those patients with a lower circulating blast count, very similar to the data I showed you with the inotuzumab. So I think these patients are best treated uh, when their counts are in the lower or nadir, uh, maybe with a pre-dose of steroids or other agents. And this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, response and overall survival curves uh, for this group of patients here. Uh, again, not a benign drug probably should only be used in a center that is comfortable doing these type of trials. Uh, patients can have a lot of uh, neurologic toxicity. They can also have some hemologic toxicity in terms of cytopenias, febrile neutropenic infections, uh, and other uh, uh, disorders. But the biggest issue is cytokine release syndrome, uh, really mirroring our uh, 
macrophage activation syndromes, or HLH, uh, reversible CNS toxicity with uh, encephalopathy. We have a patient undergoing that right now. Uh, you can even see focal seizures uh, and infections, as I've alluded to. So not a benign drug, but under the good situation can be well, uh, well utilized. Uh, the ECOG, and now led by Alliance and SWOG, uh, is using blinitumab in a consolidation phase. Uh, this is the current national trial for patients age 30 to 70 with Philadelphia negative, bless you, uh, ALL. So hopefully if those of you who are, activate, uh, who are active at centers can enroll patients to try and answer this question. So in summary on this aspect, monoclonal antibodies so far have the highest single agent activity, high MRD negative rates. There are specific toxicities between the agents that I've uh, presented, inotuzumab, thrombocytopenia, elevation of liver function tests, venoocclusive disease specifically after transplant, blinitumumab, cytokine release syndrome, neurologic toxicity, and the Seattle Genetics agent, ocular toxicity. I've already mentioned that the inotuzumab versus standard of care was completed and we're waiting the results. Uh, the approval from the FDA uh, uh, was at the, set, at the time that the phase three trial from Amgen was just starting. And so obviously that, that trial was closed in the United States because you can't randomize patients when one of your, the experimental arm just got approved. But elsewhere outside of the US, that trial is ongoing. And one of the more exciting things are the CAR T cells. Uh, there were three presentations at ASH. I'm gonna briefly go through this. Uh, these are chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells. Uh, and really the idea is you take the T cells out of the patient and it could be the patient's T cells or it could be the patient's donor T cells if the patient had a prior transplant. Uh, and it doesn't really make a difference. Lentiviral infection, now these T cells recognize CD19 and with the idea is that they can target the tumor similar to blinitumumab now, but now with these chimeric antigen T cells and induce apoptosis. Uh, the group from Penn has been doing this primarily in children. It was published in the New England Journal. Here's a couple of uh, data slides from Stephen Grupp and, uh, that he presented at ASH showing that these T cells are durable, they're long lasting, and can really lead to durable remissions in patients with ALL. The patients who relapse often relapse with a CD19 negative clone, not shocking to those of you uh, who uh, understand biology. These are clonal processes. But here we're seeing very imp impressive uh, duration of response and event-free survival. Again, these drugs or this approach is not benign. Uh, severe cytokine release syndrome. Some of these patients end up intubated in the ICU uh, and neurologic toxicity. Similar to what we talked about with blinitumumab, but up an ante, maybe 10 to 100 fold in some patients. The other centers are doing a slightly different construct, both the NCI and Sloan uh, have a slightly different construct and their uh, data was also presented and now published. Uh, here we have the group from the NCI looking at patients, again, mostly pediatric patients. These are ALL patients and these patients uh, went in with disease as opposed to some of the patients at Penn who went in with minimal disease. And here's the uh, waterfall plot showing that patients going into treatment with active disease can still achieve a complete remission and that these remissions can be durable. And then the group from uh, Jay Park and his colleagues at Memorial using a very similar construct to the NCI but very different to the construct from Penn. These T cells seem to be less durable and Jay and his colleagues have done this in an older refractory adult population, so different patients. And one of the uh, issues here I just want to draw, bring your attention is it takes about two to three weeks to make these T cells. And so you got to always think about what you're going to do with your patient in the interim while this disease is exploding. Uh, and so these patients got chemotherapy, they got freezed chemotherapy, and then their T cells later. And so the uh, impact of the chemotherapy that they got needs to be taken into account. Uh, and here's the overall survival for uh, patients uh, from uh, Sloan. Again, about a 40% survival. Very different patient population from either the NCI or PENS group. And then with a couple seconds left, what's new in T cell ALL? Uh, from years ago, Notch, present and mutated in about 60% of cases. This is on the surface and it undergoes post-translational modification uh, in order to translocate from the cytoplasm to the nucleus to cause proliferation, usually leading to MYC activation. Uh, 
John Astor and colleagues from our center showed that about two-thirds of patients have notch mutations, regardless if you're a kid or an adult, biology dictates. And then we presented our, our first phase one trial using a gamma secretase inhibitor. So gamma secretase inhibitor inhibits the translocation of the notch molecule from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And in fact, we saw patient responses, including some complete remissions uh, in a variety of patients. So I'm not going to have much time to spend on pH positive ALL, but I can tell you that the approach that we've taken is similar uh, to the Germans, less is best, steroids and spricel or desatinib. Uh, most patients get into remission, and as you can see here, no induction deaths in the 60 patients who were treated and, and presented at ASH. This has been our approach uh, to elderly or older patients with Philadelphia positive ALL. So in conclusion, Pediatric trials for young adult patients seem to be provocative and at least showing superior outcomes in large cooperative group trials. CAR T cells when, where, and which patients, these will be expensive. New monoclonal antibodies I think is a game changer, also expensive. And for those of your patients who are Philadelphia positive, uh, less is best, steroids and TKI is probably the way to go. Get your patients induced in remission and into transplant. Uh, and that's the approach that we've taken. I want to thank David for inviting me and my other colleagues who are home, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Great.